have a tail. It's fine. <laughs> I have cried all day. Happy tears, good tears, cleansing tears, sad tears, all the tears. It's, it's, isn't crying amazing? I feel like it's such a, for years, I, I didn't cry for years. This is going to be interesting. Hold on one second. Um, I was pretty disassociated for a while, and, and so the floodgates have opened. <laughs> and it's just ever so healing. It's so beautiful. Um, so this class is on songwriting, but as with everything, I feel um, like it may end up being, you know, a few things. Um, probably some of my favorite books on writing that I've read are inadvertently about writing, and they end up being like some instructions on writing and living, you know, because it all, that's where the best writing comes from, is from living. <laughs> um, so, I have 29 minutes. This is good. Um, I do want to end up over there <laughs> at some point. <laughs> so I'm really hoping to end up over there. Um, so, I don't want to talk too much. I want to just kind of give you the key, that, a couple keys that uh, my friends have given me over the last few years when it comes to writing because it's just a, friends hold keys. And it's a communal experience. Music is a communal experience. How many of you were in my songwriting class yesterday? Oh, eh, oh everybody. Cool, cool. Um, I do want to expand on that a little bit. There might be some crossover. I hope you will take that as a good thing and not a negative thing. But um, let's just pray because I love praying. And I know I said that yesterday too, but there's something about prayer where we just... <sighs> we enter into that divine communion um, Molly was praying after the worship set today, and she thanked our Trinity family. And I was like, oh, that's it. That's the thing. We, like, enter into that cosmic, um, mysterious, and abundant swirl, the, the divine dance, if you will. So let's just pray, and we'll talk. Holy Spirit. You just take a deep breath, guys. Just one big breath in <sighs> and exhale. I thank you that you are in that breath. I thank you for the breath of life that is Yahweh. I thank you for the abundant universe that we live in. I thank you for divine creativity and infinite revelation, which leads to infinite exploration and infinite songs, infinite interpretation. So I just ask that you would open the floodgates in us of the wellspring that has been there the entire time. That this wouldn't be about trying to go out and excavate and find something outside, but we would look to that internal source of spirit where we commune with you, where we experience you, that you would unlock our eyes to see, you would unlock our imagination, that we would be able to start meditating and contemplating the goodness of God, and it would make its way into lyrics and melodies and music that defines the culture that we live in, that changes the language, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, I love songs. <laughs> it's a good way to start off a songwriting class. Way to go, Amanda. I love songs. I love music. I've loved music since I was little. And um, I kind of love how sneaky music is. You know what I mean? Because we can talk about something until we're blue in the face, and then, and then we hear a song. And all of a sudden, we get it. I think we're kind of hardwired for that, the, you know, the, intu the, the intuitive sense um, of the mystery that we're wired for and the exploration of the mystery. Um, and so songs, to me, speak to that more than a lot of other things. I love all the expressions in art. I love all the performance arts. I wish I could dance. <sighs> but I'll save you from that. <laughs> um, but I love, I love, um, 
I love all of it. And, and for me, songs have been um, little minier, minier? <laughs> minions. No, songs have been little mini saving graces, and they've been angelic messengers, and they've been a way of dealing with hard reality, um, confronting deep pain, um, leaning into the faith of other people when I didn't have any. I think I'm so, I'm so moved. I, I love Ben Hastings. How many love Ben Hastings? He's, you know, and there's so many amazing writers out there, and I could talk about all of them for hours. Um, uh, Benny Hastings writes these songs, you know, like So Will I and Peace, and I just marvel at them because I feel he's this Irish poet who lives in Australia, and there's a strength of a team. There's such a strength of a team. He co-writes with brilliant and beautiful people. I've just had a chance to sit with him and hear him think out loud and ponder the goodness of God, ponder, you know, the expanse, the wild expanse of God. And so it, it makes perfect sense that his songs are these ponderings and these musings about what peace is and what creation does so we might as well too. <laughs> like it's just... He, he studies the culture and the language of, of ancient paths, but also of the culture and language that we live in. And so I feel like he merges the two, and it's so brilliant and so beautiful. And I love the fact that we can listen to songs that other people have lived. Um, we trust those ones more than the others, don't we? <laughs> you can tell when a song has been lived. Um, and, and then there's other songs that are, I mean, I think most songs are prophetic in nature if we're really tuning in. And a lot of times they come back around like 10 years later and we're like, oh, that's what it meant. Even if we're the ones who wrote it down, you know what I mean? Like I love when people come up to me and I'm like, you make me brave and have a, you know, a conversation about bravery. And I was like, oh, I'm still afraid. <laughs> Um, but uh, it's actually helped. Here's a, I make a joke like that. I've changed, like, you know how theology changes or theology develops as we spend more time in the presence. And so our, we have lots of theologies about a lot of things. And so I had a theology about fear for a long time, which was mostly that it just <laughs> ruled my life. Then it became a theology of like, I gotta speak to the fear. I gotta yell to the fear. I gotta tell the fear who I am. Most of that was for me to convince myself not really to, like, outshine the fear. And then the theology grew to, like, oh, like, my, the adjustment of my perspective, perhaps, like, my awareness was more like, whatever I am afraid of actually dominates and leads me. So the, it's not that fear is necessarily my enemy. It's that it leads me to the things I'm ashamed about so there's like a shame narrative in the background and a fear narrative in the foreground, and we concentrate so much on fear because fear seems loud, seems louder. And so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just, maybe I'll just share a little bit about You Make Me Brave now. I don't know why. But um, that song, have you guys heard that song? I don't mean to, okay. Um, the theology of, of fear um, and the theology of God, like it, it's just, it's developed in me, like it, it's become less an enemy and more a teacher, maybe, um, because I found I, as a as I'm learning, I'm like whatever I'm afraid of will actually lead my life. Like if I'm afraid of flying, and then I don't get on a plane, it's not because I mean we can we can formulate some kind of spirituality around that, but you, it just it will rule me, and I'll never see the world. Does that make sense? So whatever we're afraid of practically will actually determine the boundaries of our life and the places that we go and the things that we see. And so it was more of, it started as more of like a transference of fear. I'm like, well, it's better to, you know, it talks about fear of the Lord being the beginning of wisdom. And um, I love what Bill was saying. <laughs> That's funny to casually throw into this. I love what Bill was saying the other day. I always love what Bill says. I, um, where he was talking about, you know, when, God moves and you don't feel kind of a terrifying thing. I'm like, fear actually is not to be feared. It's a human experience of being finite. 
Does that make sense? It's, it's us coming into contact with the, our own, the threshold of our being. We're human. We're, we're finite. And yet there's this infinite nature in us that is designed to commune with the infinite nature of God. So if the infinite divine nature of God is present with me, my finite nature will become immediately aware of that. Does that make sense? And so I will tremble because I'm like, <gasps> the one who was and is to come, Emmanuel, Yahweh, the great I am, the ancient, you know, the, is here. There's a trembling factor that comes in. I mean, I tremble when I look at the ocean. I tremble when I look at mountains. There's just something that makes us feel so small and so finite, and it's ever so good. And it's like a remembering. I actually love feeling small like that. I love standing next to the ocean. It's terrifying. I almost drowned in the ocean when I was 17 years old. It got caught in a riptide. And um, what? Kindred? Spirit? And... Um, and I remember actually going back the next day, like the family I was on vacation with, we went back into the water because the mom was like, we actually need to experience the water again. So we stood in the water, like up to our knees. That's kind of all that I could handle at the moment because I was like, a day before I thought I was going to die. <laughs> and um, so anyways, my theology on fear has changed a lot. It, I mean, it, it's just evolving. Now it's becoming more of a... Um, not a conversation necessarily or a negotiation, but I'm settling into maybe more of the fear of the Lord, which is that there's like a holy intensity and respect and reverence for the fact that there is a divine being that holds every living thing together and every single breath that I breathe is borrowed. Every single breath that I breathe is intentional and every single breath that I breathe is grace. Does that make sense? So I'm, now I'm like, I'm less screaming at fear. When I sit in that place, I go, there's, there's less and less to be afraid of, you know? I used to think bravery was like standing up, rah, we're going for it. And that's, part, that's how I sang the song for years. I'm like, because I had to, because it was my survival, because I didn't, I, did not, I didn't rest in an internal knowing of being still. So I had to. And that was grace, too. We have grace for every season. Does this make sense? So uh, I don't know if this is off topic or very much on topic, but like songwriting to me is always a mysterious experience. It's always a mysterious experience, no matter how much I focus on the craft. Or, and I, I believe in practice and crafting and learning and growing and reading. And, you know, we talked a little bit about that yesterday, about practice um, but there's always, always, always going to be an element of mystery to it. And I think that's necessary. I think it keeps us in that spot of being wowed by God. Um, I didn't write worship songs until, like, in my 20s. Um, and that <laughs> <it> sounds like <laughs> I was very old when I was in my 20s. That's not true. I just, I grew up in music, and I grew up in a worship a worshipful home, and all I wanted to do was to be able to express it, but I felt like there was a giant block for years. And I could sit at the piano, and I could, when I started writing, what came out of me were, like, <laughs> heartbreak songs over a boyfriend, or, like, you know, longing songs for a new boyfriend. <laughs> Just, you, know, you know what I mean? We're in that liminal space in between relationships, and we're like, ah, oh, the longing, you know? And I laugh about it, but those were really imperative to me being able to write a worship song because I would go from that to trying to write a worship song, and I'm like, oh, this feels like I'm trying. I'm trying really hard, <laughs> trying to, like, impress God with my theology or something or tell people what they need to know even though they haven't asked the question. <laughs> but when I would step into, like, oh, I'm heartbroken, I'm 16, I'm, you know, my ex-boyfriend, how could you, you know, forget about us? It felt true. Because it was. And I'm not negating the fact that I, had, I have a beautiful history with the Lord. All of us do. But it actually took me to, in my 20s to be able to merge the worlds where, like, kind of the divine ground where our experience and the truth meet. 
And so often we just try to project the truth without actually letting ourselves experience it. And so I just, I need it. I mean, Jesus waited until he was 30 to start ministry. And I think a lot of that had to do with experiencing humanity and embracing the, 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 the nature of being human. Does that make sense? And, um, and not just projecting, but actually experiencing and practicing in the still small moments, in the little things. So for me, writing worship, it was always like, oh, if there's one thing I want to do, if there's one thing that I could do, that I could imagine doing with my life, it would be to explore God and explore music because both of them felt infinite. I have a hard time when people talk about using music um, as a means to an end because I don't feel like God does that. I feel like God delights in beautiful things. And when he created, when we read the creation story, like the music that he was singing or the way he was exclaiming or, you know, blessing what he had created, it, it didn't feel like a means to an end. It felt like he was celebrating every moment as it came. Does that make sense? So for me, music has always actually been um, like kind of a mystical, beautiful experience. And it's, it's meant to be experienced as such. And there's something that switches when we, when we change from music being like an agenda-driven, like we have to get to the point and the point is this, and instead we just rest in the beauty of a note, of a sound, and go, oh, this is so beautiful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to play this one note until something stirs in me, and then I'm going to interact with that note. Does that make sense? It's maybe perhaps a little less egoic and more transcendent. It's just a little bit, it requires a little bit more of our um, curiosity, our holy curiosity, our childlike nature to go, I'm gonna lean in, I'm gonna listen. I'm gonna listen to what it is that feels like, like it's connecting. Does that make sense? So I don't, I mean, I wanna give you practical things. That's why I wanna end up at the piano in three minutes. Wow, okay. Because I wanna give you probably the, the, the key that is, Help me the most. There's, okay, I'll tell you two things. There's two keys. One of them is that um, I was speaking to a spiritual mother of mine recently, and she was telling me a story that I will. I hope I never forget. I think it's gone to the place where I don't think it will be forgotten. I think it marked, you know, something in my life. Um, she was telling me about a time when her son was going through a rough patch, and he got a DUI, and he ended up having to be in jail for 17 days. Um, and on one of the nights that he was in jail, he called his mom. And he was describing it to her that he, he was having a hard time remembering what the sky looked like. And um, what the stars looked like. And so she went outside and she said to him, how about you feel what I see? I'll describe it to you, and you'll remember it, and then you'll be able to see it. And so she started describing the tree in front of her and the stars and what the air felt like, like the crisp air, you know, of the night. And he started to see it and feel it in his imagination. He started to remember. Because when we get in those moments being locked in the prison of our own mind, it feels like forever, doesn't it? Telling someone, oh, it's only 17 days, isn't gonna work. In those moments, it feels infinite. The sorrow feels infinite, the grief feels infinite, the terror feels infinite. And so I just thought that was one of the most beautiful stories I've ever heard about art, about seeing. And then when we were listening to Ray talk this morning about seeing, like we have a, I feel like we have a noble calling, a noble responsibility to translate what we see, what we experience, what we feel. And some of us, like Ben Hastings, will be poetic in the way that we describe. And some of us will have one note to work with. And some of us will just simply say, I love you. And that phrase is the most powerful phrase that we could ever say as human beings. Because a thousand people in a room saying I love you, it costs every single person something different. You know what I mean? We get caught up in these ideas, that, like, we get caught up in scarcity, thinking that we need to, like, try to f flower our language or make it sound more intelligent or make it sound more intellectual or make it sound better or, or rhyme it more. And I'm just like, no, the simplest, 
song of I love you that embraces your cost has the most authority. It has the most authority in your life. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, it has, it has the most authority in your life. I get so intrigued by when we're in worship and we're, we, we sing a song and then we're like, sing your own song. And then it, all of a sudden what felt like confidence turns into timidity and we're like, oh, what if somebody hears me and I don't know what to say? And maybe there's a few things going on. I know sometimes there's a lot going on in my mind when we're in worship. And I feel like what I want to do in the next 10 minutes <laughs> is just help you unlock the key to your own sanctuary of infinite possibility, your divine nature, where you commune with God, where you talk with God, where you walk with God, where you imagine, where you remember, where someone else paints a picture for you and then you experience it in the prison of your own mind, you know? And then you start to, you start to say it in your own words. You start, to, you start to experience it as you say it out loud. Does that make sense? Um, so the, the tool that I'm gonna show you is probably the one that's unlocked me the most and it's from John Paul. I think you've all experienced him. He's been playing percussion, guitar, he's teaching like a million classes. He's like this magic person, he's incredible. And um, <laughs> he, a number of years ago, I felt like I was in this writer's block thing. You know, we all use that term, like, oh, I'm just blocked, writer's block, writer's block. I'm supposed to be a writer, but I'm blocked. And I was, um, I remember getting on FaceTime with him one day having a conversation and he told me to return to the one. And I was like, what do you mean? He's so mystical, you know, he speaks in like all these parables and he was like, <laughs> help me out. <laughs> what are you saying? He was like, I, he, and because he was using music to teach me this, he said, you know how every scale, every chord has a one in it. It starts on a one. Understand what I'm saying? It's like, if you don't know where to go or where to begin or what to say or how to be, just play one note until you're moved by it, until it moves you. Let it create the moment in you rather than you creating the moment. We come at music with such dominance, you know, like conquest, like I'm going to play this. It's more about letting it play us, right? So he encouraged me to kind of let music play me for the moment. And so I sat down at the piano and I started playing one note. And I don't know about you, but I, there, are so, there are so many thoughts. I, I feel like sometimes with songs, we try to fit the entire gospel into a song. <laughs> Good luck. We try to fit like all the nature of God into one song. That's not gonna work. We have the rest of eternity to like unfurl it's so awesome. That's why I'm so moved by a song that's so focused and acute, like peace, you know, where it's just, it addresses one, just one aspect, and it unravels it a little bit, and it talks about anxiety, and it talks about the human process, and it dignifies all of it, and then it brings it back around to peace, you know what I mean? So returning to the one helped funnel and distill all of these things thoughts about and these concepts about God and these ideas of like, oh, we could write about this or this or this or this. And instead, it just brings it to a point. Makes sense? Just brings it to a really accessible point. So we're going to do this, case in point. I'm going to sit down at the piano. Is this mic on? Ooh. <laughs> you guys love me. Okay. <laughs> And I'm not, I'm not, this is not, we're just gonna do this on the fly because this is the thing that has helped me the most. Um, what I want you to do is not, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you to do something, don't take this as a rebuke. If you could, put your phones down and don't record this. This is not about like me not being recorded. This is just simply about you accessing right now your personal space. And sometimes we're like in two places at once, you know, a lot of, times these days, that's where we are. So I just wanna be here in this moment and for you to access your specific space right now, your internal space. And I'm gonna start playing, I'll give you an example, um, and then we're just gonna roll with it. 
And what I want you to do is actually like sing what comes to mind, sing it out, speak it out, give it a voice. You don't have to like raw if you don't want to, but just um, allow it to have resonance in you. Does that make sense? And so for right now, let's see what key. So here's the thing about returning to the one. Like a scale is built off of one, so if I'm in, I love the key of A flat. So I'm just gonna play the A flat. And the thing about playing one note is that you can sing anything over it within the scale, like, kind of write themselves over the one. You can hear like all those notes are free, you know what I mean? You can just take any one of them and just hang out on one, like the dissonance of this one. Right? Is this helping? Just one note, that's all you need. Well, no, <laughs> to find a melody and find a song in your own heart. And I don't move from this until I like feel like it's creating me, like creating the moment that I need. Perhaps a little self-indulgent, but I think it's necessary. <laughs> still the scale, you know what I mean? I haven't committed to a chord yet. I haven't locked anything in. Right? So just start. And if you don't have lyrics, just maybe sing. time singing that, start singing about it. Like start singing, I love you, but I don't know how to. Right? Teach me how to love. I love you, but I don't know how to. And if you do know how, just start expressing it.
See what we did there? <laughs> it's my prayer that you would feel the deep resonance of just returning to the simple, the simplicity of that one note, that one, that one note that locks into place and then like unravels you. Does that make sense? So just find one note, start there, and let it lead you. I'm just gonna pray. And then Darlene's gonna come up and blow our minds. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for all the songs in this room. Thank you for all of the stories. Thank you that you dignify every moment. Nothing's wasted. Thank you for all of the I love yous and the I don't know how tos. Thank you for all the questions and answers. I just ask that our lives would be deeply resonant, that we would be scribes in our generation, write the good news of the gospel down through our interpretation, where the divinity meets our humanity on that sacred ground. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.